I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss Monday morning's massive missile strikes against Ukrainian cities that left thousands of people without electricity and water. We analyse the impact of Russia's exit from the Black Sea grain deal and report on the Ukrainian attack on the Black Sea fleet on Saturday. And also, I've been speaking to Mikhail Sava. He's an expert at the Centre for Civil Liberties, the organisation that recently won the Nobel Peace Prize. Mikhail has been working on returning Ukrainian citizens, who had been, he claims, abducted by the Russian armed forces. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in failure. Ukraine can win, Ukraine must win, and Ukraine will win. In the midst of a terrible war that must be seen successfully to its conclusions. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 31st of October, day 250. And today, I'm joined by our assistant foreign editor, Katie O'Neill, and our associate editor, Dominic Nichols. I started by asking Katie for the latest news from Ukraine. So today, from kind of early on this morning, we saw a fresh wave of missile strikes across Ukraine. There have been uh, strikes reported in Venetia, Kherson, Kiev and Zaporizhia. Um, Ukraine this morning saying that more than 50 cruise missiles um, have landed across the country today. Russia has come out and uh, claimed responsibility for these, saying that it struck specifically energy systems in Ukraine with high precision strikes. And this has kind of been a tactic that we have seen increasingly over recent weeks, where Russia is targeting energy infrastructure and, and leaving citizens pretty vulnerable as a result in Kyiv today that they've said that 80% of homes are without water and then a further 350,000 homes are without power. So this is a, a tactic that we're increasingly seeing being deployed by the Russian forces and interestingly what this is causing is sort of a fresh wave of refugees who are being forced to leave Ukraine um, not because they are solely worried about the danger of war uh, a lot of them deciding to remain steadfast and stay there but they're finding themselves in a position increasingly where they don't have power and water. And it, as we approach the colder months, it's getting increasingly difficult to remain at home. So we had our correspondent, James Crisp, in Hungary, where he's saying that the centre where Ukrainian refugees are being welcomed along the border uh, is just becoming increasingly overwhelmed. It's starting to look more like what it did at the start of the uh, invasion. But this is just a sign of energy infrastructure being hit and as a result, people being forced to flee their homes. We're also seeing this across Europe, Poland, uh, feeling the crunch. They have been a, a country that's been very welcoming towards Ukrainian refugees, but definitely experiencing this fresh wave. I know in Ireland, ministers have said that they can't guarantee that Ukrainian refugees are going to be able to have beds. They're saying they can't rule out them sleeping rough because the centres that they have set up for them uh, are just full. They're at capacity and they're having to sort of create sort of makeshift facilities for them. But the demand at the moment is uh, outstripping what they're able to provide. Thanks, Katie. Uh, we'll come back to these missile strikes. I know that Dom has quite a few notes on them. Katie, you were editing on Saturday. Uh, when, when Russia halted its role in the Black Sea deal, this is for exporting uh, agricultural produce from Ukraine. Can you talk us through what happened and why? Yeah, so this uh, deal was brokered, I believe, during the summer. I think it was in July. It was a UN brokered deal. And basically, Russia, by signing up to this deal, agreed that it would no longer or would not target any ships that were leaving Ukraine with grain and wheat. Most of these exports are going to places that desperately need them in Africa and in Asia and in India. And this was a real difficult uh, portion of the war while this deal was being negotiated. So Russia was going to allow for the safe passage of these ships out of Ukrainian ports. Ukraine in turn said that it would demine the ports um, uh, as its side of the bargain. And uh, Turkey and the UN would inspect the ships um, and, and Russia would also oversee that so there was a guarantee that these ships were just carrying foodstuffs and not any sort of weapons. 
Uh, on Saturday morning, there was a strike in um, Sevastopol, uh, a number of drone strikes. Initially, Russia said that it had repelled most of them. Then it uh, seemed as though some of those strikes uh, were successful. Um, and, and Dom can talk to you a little bit more about that Black Sea attack. Uh, but as a result, later on in the day, Russia said that it was going to pull out of this hard fought for deal. Um, So this is going to make things really tricky uh, going forward in terms of the export of this uh, food stuff. You know, we've we've talked a lot about how Ukraine has been dubbed the breadbasket of Europe because it provides so much grain and wheat to the rest of the world. Um, In Britain, we don't actually, and and in in Europe, we don't receive these shipments that are coming out of Ukraine Ukraine currently. Um, But what it does mean is that it's going to have a big impact on food inflation. So this morning, Morning, we already saw that the price of wheat increased by over 7% as a result of Russia pulling out of this deal. And Russia has today in kind of an ominous warning if these ships continue to leave Ukrainian ports, then without its participation, then that's going to be quite dangerous. So that's quite an ominous warning. And perhaps suggesting that they are willing to target these ships as they're leaving with this all important um, grain. Today, we did see two ships leaving this morning, despite Russia pulling out of the deal. Uh, And there are 12 further ships that are scheduled to leave today. So we're keeping a close eye on that. Um, But yeah, quite a worrying development. Thanks very much uh, for that, Katie. Dom Nichols, can I bring you in, first of all, on these missile strikes? I know you've got quite a few notes on them. Um, What have you been reading? Hi, David, and and hi, everybody. So the the Ukrainian Air Force has put out some information this morning about these uh, about these strikes across the country. They say that 55 cruise missiles were fired and that they shot down 44 and 18 sites of national infrastructure were hit. Now, the uh, Ukrainian Air Force says that it was Russian Tu-95 and Tu-160, the Tupolev bombers, the big strategic bombers that fired these air-launched cruise missiles. They're saying both the Kh-101 and Kh-555 variant of air-launched cruise missiles. Um, now, the, I mean, the maths, if you look around, the, the, you can easily get confused in the maths. Some people are saying there were more sites hit or more things shot down. Um, but it's around about that that kind of figure. It's worth noting that uh, they also said that the, the, the different air commands that the Ukrainian Air Force has around the country, um, they shot down 18 uh, in the centre, 12 in the south, one of which landed in Moldova albeit there were no, no casualties reported there, nine in the east and five uh, in the west. Now, Alexei Reznikov, Ukraine's defence minister, he put out a tweet on October the 14th saying he was comparing that the, the number of uh, missiles uh, of certain natures that Russia were assessed to have on February the 24th and as at that date, October the 4th, uh, 14th. So he says that, that on that date, Russia started the war with this phase of the war with 444 of these cruise missiles as of February the 24th and had used 213 by October the 14th. So if we if they if there's another 55 used today that takes Russia's stocks down to 158. Reznikov also said that uh, the Iskander, the short-range ballistic missiles, um, as of October the 14th, they had 124 left out of the 900 they started with in February, and the calibre C launched missiles, they had 272 of 500. So these, I mean, these figures are a couple of weeks out of date, as I said, with the current wave of attacks against the national infrastructure, we think that these are the types of munitions that have been used. And it's just notable, the reason I mention it is because it's notable that these numbers are very, are very, very low. Now, these things don't get replaced very easily. A lot of them rely on technology from the West, which is obviously subject to sanctions. So Russia's ability to replace these missiles will be severely constrained. And this is one of the reasons we've, we've mentioned many times on the pod why there are so many um, so dumb bombs being used uh, that, are, that are unguided and are, and are going all over the place. Russia may, may think that they're trying to target military installations. I, I'm not sure that's true. They just seem to be um, able and willing to to terrorise the population in the hope of breaking the national will to continue the fight. But it just shows you how close they are to actually running out of these of these stocks. So in response this morning, uh, the Ukrainian MOD have put out a tweet saying on the occasion of Halloween, the Russians decided to carry out another act of missile terror. But tomorrow is all Saints Day. St. Javelin and St. Hymars will subdue the evil spirits, which was quite a a good response. And um, and just one other thing. 
So I had an interview interviewed on Friday, Alexander Zavitnovich, who's the chairman of Ukraine's Defense Security and Intelligence Parliamentary Committee. And we were talking about, we were talking specifically about the drone, drone strikes. We weren't, um, these attacks hadn't happened at the time. I was asking him about President Zelensky's note on Thursday evening in his in his nightly address when he was talking about he hinted at receiving external support from Israel and and I asked Mr Zavitnovich if this was a way of, of sort of combating the the Shahid 136 drones um and and whether that was the uh, whether that was the the form of assistance and uh, Mr Zavitnovich said this is a quote I think those talks are ongoing at ministerial level communications it's more about defense from those drones we've shot a lot uh, shot them down a lot and have more information on how to do that. Maybe Israel can give us something more on that. So I said, "Ooh, is that is that Iron Dome you're talking about? Israel's anti anti missile uh, or air defence dome?" And uh, and he said, "Mr. Zvitnovich said they could be having talks about that." So I mean, by no means, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't do a story on the back of that saying Israel is going to supply Iron Dome to Ukraine. But it certainly sounds as if it's uh, as if it's on the uh, on the agenda. Thanks, Tom. Can I just ask, um, Katie made the point uh, that R- R- Russia's rather ominous remark that you know, ships aren't going to be very safe now that they're not involved in the deal. I mean, how did how did you read that? And um, what capacity do you think that they have to follow up on any threats they make? Well, they've certainly got the capacity to. I mean, their their willingness to fire munitions into civilian areas um, and against civil infrastructure. I mean, we're, we're watching that on a, on a daily basis. I mean, these talks about um, about hitting the grain ships, I mean, they've, they've said it before. They've sort of teed it up a little bit in the way that they teed up the, the dirty bomb thing over the last couple of weeks. And in fact, the whole nuclear thing over the last few months. I mean, they talk about this sort of stuff to make us go, oh, no, they're going to attack the ships. Of course, if anything happened, they would they would blame it on I don't know, Ukrainian mines in the harbours or, or, or whatever. I think they would be extremely foolish to do that and, and they and they know it. Um, they say these things because there's there's not an awful lot else that they can do. I thought it was very interesting that the UN got involved here. Uh, I mean, you know, I've, you know, my views on, on the UN, I think they should be doing an, an awful lot more here. But if the UN are act- actively taking a stance here when Russia... Is, uh, basically does not want them to as opposed to in the past the UN have been sort of dragged to the party a bit late when it's when it's already whatever issue is at hand has been kind of priced in the UN then then act they sort of spring out the blocks a couple of months late if they're actually coming out fairly early here and in the face of Russian opposition about the grain ships that is very interesting and and dare I say a, you know a, finally a bold stance brave stance from the UN um, in which case what about the uh, strikes on civilian areas and critical national infrastructure, UN? I look forward to your, to your comments on those. So back to your original original question. I'm unsurprised that Russia would say or raise the, raise the sort of boogeyman um, issue of, well, you know, ooh, those ships are extremely vulnerable going down um, through the Black Sea. The more, I think, the more that Turkey gets involved here to guarantee, or not guarantee the safety, but they can't do that. But the more Turkey get, get involved, less chance there is of Russia taking any action. And I think that likelihood anyway is very, very small. Casey, I know you want to come in on this. Going back to the issue of, of the grain, it is a, I mean, for, for lack of a better word, a clever hand for Russia to play. We've seen that they have made oil such a huge issue for the world. And, and that is within their gift to with their control of, of so much of the world's oil. And we see this again with grain, you know, if they, if they can starve parts of Africa and India and Asia by depriving them of grain and, and a lot of this grain is going to places that are extremely impoverished and you know in some instances on the break of uh, on the brink of famine um, it, it is a, a card for them to play and, and as I sort of touched on earlier this does have an impact for the wider world because it will inevitably uh, lead to the cost of wheat and grain rising in the west so yeah perhaps not uh, unsupply, uh, unsurprising um and that that warning from russia today that it's you know it, that it would be risky for these grain exports to continue with it not being signed up to this deal any any longer i mean it, it's not all that surprising um and yeah as as dom said the the un did broker this deal and that was a a massive win for them and for all of the parties involved but they're leaving a lot to be desired in this conflict and that is you know pretty obvious 
with the UN Security Council, the fact that Russia has still got a, a veto there makes the, the whole thing quite farcical. So, uh, yeah, it will be interesting to see the sort of action that they take in the coming days to try and get this back on the road. But I don't uh, imagine that that's something that's going to be achieved anytime soon. Thanks, Katie. Dom, can I come back to you? Can we go to the, the source of this? There was a, a, an attack on the Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol. This is on Saturday. We think waterborne, we think with drones. Dom, can you talk us through what we think happened? I, I recognise it's it only a few days ago. And the details are somewhat patchy, but can you, can you t- talk to us about what do we know? Yeah, sure. I, the, I would make a note, first of all, to say that when, when you say that the, the attack on Sevastopol, we'll talk about in a moment, was the root of these, of these strikes. Um, I'm not sure that's correct. And Dmitry Kaleba, Ukraine's foreign minister, made the point this morning that, that, that we should not talk about the strikes today, quote, in response to, unquote, the attack on Sevastopol. Forgive me, I meant the, the pulling out of the grain deal was, was this, this was the, the given reason. Ah, right. OK, sorry. Pulling out of the grain deal. Well, I, I mean, the other thing to, to note on the grain deal, of course, is that the, the way Russia is trying to frame grain in this war is they've, they've been trying to court um, particularly Africa and other areas of the world that are reliant on grain who don't have a huge, I mean, they've got other pressing problems at home. The war in Ukraine is is somewhat remote for them. These are the sort of countries in Africa and and so on and so forth that I'm mentioning here. However, what they do have is a vote at the UN General Assembly. So this is one reason why Russia has been courting them and trying to frame this as all a Ukrainian problem or a problem of, of Ukraine's making, that they're not getting their grain. So any deal that gets the grain out with Russia in opposition to that just crumbles the argument across Africa and elsewhere in the world that it's Ukraine that's trying to stand in the way of them getting um, of them getting fed. Um, but on to the, the attack on Saturday. So Saturday morning, the uh, military port, naval port, Russia's, Russia's naval port in occupied Crimea, Sevastopol, about 20 past four in the morning, there were, there were strikes, um, waterborne and we think airborne. Um, a number of it, uh, vessels were hit, we believe, including the a, a frigate that, since the sinking of the Moskva, has acted as the Black Sea, Black sea Fleet's flagship. So the Admiral Makarov, which is uh, an air defence uh, frigate, but also a, a, a minesweeper or mine hunter. Sorry, no minesweeper. Going to get going to get beasted here by the Royal Navy, but I don't I don't, I don't think the Russians have mine hunters. They got mine sweepers. But essentially, the Ivan Golubets uh, mine thingamajiggy was also hit. Now, what we think happened, footage online showed an uncrewed surface vessel um, sort of bouncing through the waves, getting repeatedly shot at by an MI8 or an MI, MI17. Couldn't really see which side the tail radar was on to obviously tell us which one of those two variants it was. I apologise for that. Um, but how, there were reports also of, of uncrewed air vehicles at the same time. Now, the Russian MOD has said that there were seven... Uh, uh, basically surface drones and nine airborne drones that they were quote all interceptive all intercepted um what i would say though and this is why i'm being very cautious on this on this bit is because we haven't we've not seen any footage afterwards so the the footage we saw allegedly from these uncrewed surface vessels um that ukraine haven't haven't um accepted liability for but the footage very clearly shows whatever it was going right up to um, to, to the point to the point that camera cuts out against the frigate which open source information open source intelligence sites on social media have um, identified as the Admiral Makarov frigate uh, but if Russia are saying that they were all intercepted and nothing happened here no, nothing to see gov then what, against this storm of, of social media saying yeah they, they definitely got hit why has Russia not put out footage today? showing the uh, Admiral Makarov and the Ivan Golubits sailing quite happily around around Sevastopol. I don't know. Russian MOD has blamed the Royal Navy, very interestingly, saying that um, this is, is all down to the Brits again, a bit like the dirty bomb. I, I just, I mean, it might be because you may remember we did a story, we did a story, actually, the Telegraph story, about the U- Ukrainian Navy training here in Britain on the Remus autonomous mine hunting drones. It was reported, we reported it on August the 27th, and I actually conducted an interview with some of the Ukrainian sailors on uh, day 187. So if you want to go go back and look look through the pods, day 187 had a, had an interview with some of the uh, some of the uh, Ukrainian sailors there. We also did a story on September the 22nd of what what we 
thought was a, an uncrewed surface vessel that had washed up in Crimea. And this had cameras on board. It was GPS guided. It had um, water jets. It was quite a quite a um, an intricate uh, piece of um, seamanship to put it together. And we think it had a warhead in the front. I mean, again, this was it was suggested that this was the latest bit of innovation from Kiev. Uh, they they didn't they neither confirm nor deny. But it looked as if it had a couple of devices at the very front of the vessel that would set off a warhead. Now. Compare that, and you can go and, like I say, you can go and have a look on September the 22nd. Just just have a you know, Google for the Telegraph. You'll find it. Compare that with the image from social media of uh, of whatever this uncrewed surface vessel bouncing towards the, the Russian frigates. It does look as if you're, you're, you're staring at the first two or three feet of the vessel that, that seemingly washed up on Crimea. So how many of these things Ukraine have got, we do not know. Um, but it, it does su- suggest that this was a coordinated surface and air strike against uh, against vessels. I mean, the the, fo- the footage is very interesting. You see the you'll see the helicopter flying around the MI eight or the seventeen flying around and firing at the at the vessel. The shots are very accurate, but but seemingly they all they all miss because it makes its way through and up to the vessel. Um, you may remember another story from April April the twenty eighth that we did uh, as well as others saying that there were reports based on um, satellite imagery from Maxar, the, the US-based um, satellite imagery company, that was saying that, that pens had been set up around Sevastopol's harbour um, for Russian Navy-trained dolphins to, to help uh, defeat any underwater sabotage. We know Russia experimented with this, as did others, during the Cold War. We think Russia used dolphins um, and, and sort of other, other mammals in Syria. Um, to protect from the from the sea, uh, so I mean, if if they did, then it clearly didn't work here. Uh, but the important point about this strike is, well, firstly, we don't we don't know what happened, and I think that is important because many people are, are running away saying, "Oh, this is amazing! Look, Ukrainian innovation! This is a, a a new dawn of of warfare." People have compared it to the Battle of Taranto, in November nineteen forty, when the um, which was the first all aircraft ship to ship naval attack in history this was the british fleet air arm that attacked the italian uh, italian fleet at anchor people say oh this is a new taranto it shows drones and what, what's going to happen in the future well i mean we don't know what happened we don't know if it was successful so we we should, we should be very cautious about claiming this is the, the the dawn of a new era i mean we've had drones for for many many years putting them together and operationalizing sorry wonky term but what i mean is actually making them all work together and sinking the fleet or at least having the effect have some sort of effect that you're after we don't know if that happened here so we've got to be very careful about lauding this as some new um, new new form of warfare but what it must do what it will do is it will force russia to divert resources to uh, to protect its harbor and its ship ships at anchor i mean if you think about after the moskva was sunk um, they sent a lot of their fleet to port they moved a lot of their kilo class diesel subs away from from Crimea. We have seen attacks like this in the past. Uh, If you remember the USS Cole, the US ship in October 2000 that was in in, um, Yemen, in in the port of Aden, was attacked by Al-Qaeda with, we think, about two or 300 kilograms of explosive, a a ship, a fast inshore attack craft, as they're called, but basically a, a small motorboat, speedboat, was rammed against USS Cole, 17 U.S. sailors killed in that. So this idea of of whizzing in from the sea um, is not necessarily new. It's been around, I'd say, from the Second World War, and most recently we saw that in the, in the coal. Um, now, anything that hits a, a, a ship at or below the sea line is very, very dangerous indeed for the integrity of that vessel. Whether or not it it kind of breaks the back of the ship, so mines and torpedoes are designed to blow the water away from underneath the ship for a, a kind of fraction of a second so so for a microsecond the whole ship is suspended it's trying to support its own weight and of course they're not designed to do that so so the ship then falls into that hole which may only be a couple of meters deep but it falls into that hole of air and breaks the back of the ship and 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 that's it done so anything that that hits um, at or below the waterline is very very serious now these kind of explosives the uss coal attack and and this um alleged you know what we think is this uh, you know the autonomous drone this surface drone they simply haven't got the explosive power to do that to lift a ship or blow the water away from under it so the ship breaks its own back but even so you know you put holes in the side of a ship at or below the waterline then you know you're not going to be um you're not going to be 
flavor of the month if you're the captain of that ship so it's very very serious this could be this could be a new type of 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 warfare we talked about drone swarms before normally seen it the thinking has been sort of airborne um swarms um so this if this is marrying air and surface and who knows maybe there was subsurface as well then it that's very very interesting russia should now put more effort into as we all should i mean this is a lesson here for every navy around the world you know you know you should not um think that your your ship at anchor um with somebody bored on the 12.7 mil cannon at the front is is enough you know we should all be thinking about these how to protect ships at anchor ships in harbor um so it might be it might be a new era of warfare but uh, until we see what the results are um we don't know but i do think it's telling that russia has not responded to this with very obvious and very fast um imagery of the of the vessels that supposedly got hit um the admiral makarov and the ivan golibits uh, sailing around today quite happily Thanks, Dom. Katie, you were editing on Saturday, as you said. What would you like to add to this? I think something that's worth mentioning is that after this attack happened early on on Saturday morning, Russia accused the British Royal Navy of being involved. So they accused this regiment of the Navy or, or this branch of planning uh, and the provision and implementation of the attack in Sevastopol. They also claimed that this unit was responsible for assisting Ukraine in blowing up the Nord Street pipeline which uh, you know the idea that that it was anyone but Russia that was responsible for this has sort of been uh, widely disproven but interesting that they t- turned their ire on the British forces in response the British Ministry of Defense accused Russia of peddling false claims on an epic scale and they're saying that they were sort of doing this um, to distract from the dysfunction within their own forces so interesting that they they pointed the finger at the British forces after this happened and accusing them of helping Ukraine to uh, to launch this drone attack. Thank you very much, Casey, and thank you, Dom. Um, Dom, any updates from the rest of Ukraine? I know we, we focused on the massive strikes uh, across the country this morning, uh, and we've looked at the attack on Sevastopol on Saturday. Um, what else is happening elsewhere? Well, it's been very busy along the along the the, the line, as we understand it, the, the front line around Hezon up through the Donbass and uh, in the in the Kharkiv region to the northeast, uh, mainly artillery, few missiles, but we think mainly artillery duels. And uh, we think, I think there was a report in the Washington Post, might have got that wrong, saying that, that U- Ukraine believe they've now, they are now either on a parity or, or, or have more numbers of tubes, tube artillery than than Russia, which would be very telling indeed. Um, but no, still, it has been very busy a, a, across the front. No major advances uh, from either side. Uh, very small incremental gains, we think, uh, for Ukraine in the uh, in the Donbass and down Hezon. Um, Russia, in particular, the Wagner private military company um, under Yevgeny Prigozhin is, is still concentrating in the center against the town of Bakhmut, but really not making any ad- advances there. So there's very little, very little movement. I mean, the weather is getting is getting worse. Um, if you think about the casualties, so the Ukrainian uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry say that over 71,000 Russians have been killed in this war. We originally were very skeptical about either side putting out, putting out numbers. I think as month, months have gone on, we think Ukraine is actually probably closer closer to the the truth. Although you know you've got to take all these things with a pinch of salt. But I mean, even if it's if it's closer, and the last time we had a Western official that would go that would go firm on a on a on a reasonable estimate, it was it was fairly close to the Ukrainian figure. So let's say let's say there's fifty thousand, which doesn't seem unreasonable if Ukraine's saying 70, 71,000. If there's fifty thousand KIA killed in action, dead. Then the, the standard metric is three to one in terms of um, injured, so so taken off the battlefield, which is, uh, you know, just as just as important. So fifty thousand dead, one hundred and fifty injured. That, there's your two hundred thousand. So that's the original army that, that that went over the border on February the twenty fourth this year. So you can see why um, Putin's had to rely on mobilisation. Although interestingly, Sergei Shoigu, the defence minister, says that that mobilisation is over now. They've got all the numbers they need. I really wouldn't believe that. Um, you know, you need to take a salt mine with those kind of statistics. And accordingly, you know, Ramzan Kadyrov, the Chechen leader, has, has said today on Telegram, said he hasn't stopped mobilisation. He's still trying to raise raise people from, from Chechnya for the war. So, you know, they need to find bodies from somewhere because they just simply haven't got the numbers. What they have got is, is mass um, and Ukraine 
does not have mass. So, so when we look at the, the, the lines that, that aren't shifting too much, we, you, you might think, well, how can that be? If, if Russia, as I keep saying, is a hollow army, it's, it's, it's very artillery led, it's, it's, it's poorly equipped, trained, it doesn't have great faith in its command, um, its doctrine is, is, is not good. Um, how come Ukraine can't break through? Well, I mean, they, they have occasionally, we saw that in Kharkiv a couple of months ago, they, um, but, they, but they, are, they seem very good at assessing risk, Ukraine, and only really going for it and pushing hard and committing men and women and, and much needed materiel when they are confident of success, because what they cannot afford to do is, is try and match Russia um, casualty for casualty. They just simply can't soak it up. So I think, I think when we look at the lines not moving very much, that doesn't necessarily give the whole picture because what's happening in the background, Ukraine, there's a huge amount of training in UK and elsewhere across, across Europe. What Russia is doing in the face of training, it's, it's mobilising um, men, giving them old equipment and uh, just saying, off, off you go. And we've already seen a lot of mobilised people have been killed um, in, uh, in the war. So that's one of the reasons why the, the lines are, are very static. I think, I, I think there might be one big effort left this side of winter, probably in the, in the south in Hezon, uh, which is gearing up for a, possibly for a horrific urban, urban battle there. But I think the lines will be largely static until, the, until this sort of next wave of, of mobilised troops from Russia, mobilised, untrained, ill-equipped troops from Russia, and uh, arguably a smaller number but better trained and better equipped troops on Ukraine's side uh, really comes into effect. Thanks, Tom. Just one very quick question for you before we go to your final thought. Um, you mentioned a parity in tube artillery. That, can you just talk us through that? What does that actually mean for people who, for people who, who didn't spend 20 years in the army? You mean there are some people here who didn't spend 20 years in the army? <laughs> Right, so I mean, very broadly, there's, there's different types of artillery, um, rockets, missiles, uh, dumb bombs, although th- they're increasingly being taken over by things like Excalibur rounds, which are GPS guided and, and very clever. Um, but essentially, uh, Russia has always, back back to Soviet days, has always believed in being very, very heavily artillery led. Their, their, their strategy, such as it is, is to pound an area with uh, with artillery and then send in tanks and troops afterwards to plant a flag on the rubble. And that's basically that basically about it. They, they don't go into for what what um, in Western armies is called combined arms, which is all the different parts of the military orchestra working together. So the infantry working with tanks, working with engineers, working with air defence, working with um, signalers, working with logisticians, all the rest of it. You know, everyone working together to, to crack whatever the problem is that's in front of you. Um, Russia haven't done that. They, they took on the legacy from, from the Soviet army, the Red Army, of, of uh, being heavily artillery led. And in the first few months of the war, that, that's, that's what we saw, that, that Ukraine had very little way of, of being able to um, push back against that. It was, it was incredibly devastating. I mean, there's just the sheer weight of firepower. But two things happened. Firstly, um, the Russian artillery systems are uh, supply or kept resupplied mainly by rail. They 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 very much rely on on rail lines simply for the for the amount of artillery shells. I mean these, these things are blooming heavy. And as somebody who had to carry one on my shoulder on my birthday, I seem to remember my first birthday in the army. Um, they are blooming heavy. These one five five mil shells. Um, so yeah, you need you need rail much more so than 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 road to supply this. Ukraine were very good then at um, at cutting those rail lines and pushing their combined arms effort to taking those towns that were critical strategic railheads, so cutting those lines of supply. And the other big thing, I mean, there, there are no silver bullet weapons here, no, no pun intended. There are no, there's no one weapon that, that's, that's going to uh, win the war. Um, but the introduction of HIMARS, the US HIMARS system, high mobility artillery rocket system, very long range, um, very accurate um, artillery systems that could could in, instead of instead of just sort of blanketing an area with fire um, and, uh, and and hoping to, to kill people and knock out equipment, but but create space for your your guys to run into into that cleared space. Um, the, these new modern precision artillery will will select individual pieces of equipment and and destroy those. So much more efficient use of of artillery. Now, you may remember it took it took a while 
for um, for the US and others, uh, UK and, and well, everyone really. I'm not trying to single out the US here, but it took a while to supply these these natures of, of equipment. There was um, reluctance. I think there was a fear that they might be used to fire into Russia itself, which w- w- was deemed too provocative and too escalatory from NATO's point of view. Um, Ukraine have shown themselves to be uh, m- mature employers of, of, of violence um, and high precision weaponry. So uh, over the last few months, there's been um, much less reluctance to, to supply these these natures of, of, of equipment to, to Ukraine. High Mars have gone in, other multiple launch rocket systems have gone in and um, they were able to destroy the Russian artillery pieces and the headquarters that supplied them uh, or supported them and coordinated them and, and led the fight and so on and so forth. And slowly by slowly, the two things together, knocking out the equipment and cutting those rail supply lines and and, and explo- you know, blowing up the the ammunition dumps um, meant that Russia was not able to bring its its weight of artillery to the fight. And so without that, what did they have left? Well, they had a load of tanks that very helpfully just went in a straight line and got nibbled off by this very brave Ukrainian um, sort of tank hunting teams that would go out uh, generally at night using the um, using anti tank guided missiles and, and and destroying those tanks and, and infantry fighting vehicles, the the BMP and the BTRs and, and what have you. But after the you know, absent the artillery, there was no real great thinking about how to employ their military force against that threat. And the other the last point I'll make is that that time and time again, Russia has shown itself shown that it is not a learning organisation. Um, so it, it's not seen what's happening on the battlefield and adjusted accordingly. It, it does not. It's very heavily centralised. It does not believe in allowing junior level commanders at, at whatever level, battalion commanders, company commanders, individual troop platoon commanders to make decisions and go for it, seizing opportunities, using their initiative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they've been very, very bogged down when these problems have presented themselves. These decisions go right the way back either to the to the senior military leadership and often, we think, uh, back to Moscow for Putin personally to say yay or nay. So they've been really stymied by their own doctrine, uh, relying heavily on artillery that either isn't there or is not supplied or can't adjust to a new um, a new set of circumstances in front of it. Um, compare that to, to Ukraine. Who have a, it took a little while. I mean, they're, 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 trying, they're trying to learn new systems and new we- weapon systems and doctrine. But they've been much more, they've much more readily accepted risk and backed their own people to, like I say, seize initiatives, tr- try things. If you try, you fail most often. Uh, now, in a, in, a, in a system like Russia's, failure is, is an e- a career ender, you know, maybe even a life ender. But, you know, it's not that in, in a learning organisation. You try, you fail. You fail again, you fail better. You fail a third time, you fail better, and then you crack it. I mean, look at the attack this weekend. If as what we think was a, com- a combined effort of, of of surface drones and air drones attacking the fleet in Sevastopol. I mean, that, that doesn't just happen. You try, 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 you fail, 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 you break things, you you know, you've, you waste a load of money, you keep trying. You can only do that if your boss is prepared to give you the, the, the leash to, to have a play and make it work. And if and if he's or her boss, equally, it gives you the confidence to, to go and do it. So two really competing systems here. Um, and I say it all comes back to, to, to Russia that's very reliant on artillery and those of the, the, the reason for that and the reason why that was so good in the first few weeks of the war um, has have been systematically eroded by Ukraine and I think will continue to, to be so, such that they're now, um, not only is Ukraine eroding the, the number of artillery um, tubes, artillery you know, rockets and, and pieces of, of artillery and, um, weapons that they have, but they've also been... Uh, developing their own and getting a huge number of arms supplied by uh, by external partners, and that's why I think that report. And I should, while I was talking, I should have been searching to see if it was the, the Washington Post. Forgive me, I can't I can't remember where it was. Suggesting that there's now parity. Parity is never good. You want to attack somebody, you need a three to one advantage generally in in um, rural combat. Those numbers go through the roof. Um, at least double that. Um, in uh, in in urban combat, terrific urban combat. We need to do a deep dive on 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 urban combat. Parity is is good for Ukraine because they've come from such a low base, and it's absolutely um, fatal for Russia. Uh, Dom, it doesn't have to be long. What are you looking at over the next few days? Well, I just note talking about command just then. It, of note, Russia has sacked or Putin has sacked the Central Military District Commander General um, Alexander Lapin. He was relieved of command and apparently sent 
on holiday. I mean, because because that's what you do when you're relieved relieved of command. Um, now, the the thinking here is that Yevgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner Group, uh, is increasingly close to Putin. He's saying that his fighters are, are making any advances that they have, and that the the the, the central um, military district are just gone gone nowhere. He is alleged. Prigozhin is alleged to have said uh, to Putin, "Get Lapin the away from the fight." I can't I can't sort of you know fill, complete that sentence. There's talk that this is Putin trying to uh, firstly bow to Prigozhin, who who is seemingly increasingly uh, listened to. Uh, to the to the much to the chagrin of the security forces in in the Kremlin, but also uh, if Putin is trying to gear up to make any kind of grand offer of a peace plan, whereby um, he would hand back the areas of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast that he's taken since February the twenty fourth, then um, General Lapin, who was uh, Lapin, who was given the uh, awarded the Hero of Russia for the liberation of Luhansk, uh, he just he just couldn't stay around. I mean, whatever the reason, you start sacking your senior leaders, that is that is not a good sign. You, you don't want flux at the very senior levels. I think that's indicative, again, of this war not going well for, for Russia. And they're casting around. The blame storming has started. Um, and it just it will it will not give confidence to the to the rest of the Russian forces if their senior leadership are, are, are being sacked. So let's see if there's any, any more of that. But I thought that was quite interesting that, uh, that Lapin was sacked and went on holiday. Thanks, Tom. I mean, and the, the context of that on the Ukrainian side is the Ukrainians continue to train, continue to import more weapons and armour. Uh, their morale, despite the attacks on cities, uh, seems relatively undimmed. Uh, so all of that going into the winter paints a much rosier picture, I think, for the Ukrainian armed forces than the Russian. A month ago, I spoke to Mikhail Safa. He is a political scientist with numerous publications under his belt. He also serves on the expert council of the Center for Civil Liberties based in Kyiv. He's a Russian citizen with refugee status in Ukraine. Thank you to Mikhail for his time and to Roman for the translation. Within this interview, Mikhail alleges that Ukrainian civilians have been kidnapped by Russian army personnel or Russian proxies and subjected to torture and generally poor treatment. He also alleges that Russia has committed war crimes. We have not been able to verify these reports ourselves, but the UN says that a number of Ukrainians have been arbitrarily detained and subject to enforced disappearances in Russian-controlled areas. Russian authorities have previously acknowledged that a number of Ukrainians are now in Russia, but they assert that they were evacuated for their own safety. Just a warning, some of our listeners may find some of what Mikhail says disturbing. Here's Mikhail. Good morning. Uh, I'm situated in city of Orzel. It is uh, suburbs of Kiev. It is a uh, uh, city near Bucha. And can you tell us about your, your job, your role at the moment? What are you doing? I work for a Kiev-based think tank, a human rights organization called Center for Civil Liberties. It's this organization is uh, active in human rights domain for more than 15 years now, and it's uh, protecting and uh, promoting democracy, human rights uh, values in uh, Ukraine and in uh, Eurasia region. Mikhail, your your work at the moment in the last few months has been focused on uh, Ukrainians who've been kidnapped and t- taken to Russia. Could you give our listeners a a, a sense of what's been happening? Um, a from the beginning of the conflict to now. Mikhail, your work in the last few months focuses on Ukrainians who have been kidnapped. We started to document war crimes uh, since the Russian illegal invasion in Ukraine on 24 February. For me personally, at 3rd of March, I witnessed a Russian uh, army vehicle killing uh, and destroying two cars and killing six civilians in these cars. And so 3rd March, I was an eyewitness of a war crime committed by Russian uh, military uh, unit, by Russian army. I work with the cases of uh, civilian non-combatant prisoners, and th- th- our organization uh, know about at least 671 persons who were kidnapped and illegally detained, either on the territory of Russian Federation or on the territory temporarily occupied by Russia. Federation in the south and eastern part of Ukraine. And we also know that 410 people among our list are held incommunicado. So it is impossible to know uh, precisely where are they located, the state of their health, and whether they are alive 
at all. But we f for sure know they are kidnapped and uh, stationed uh, somewhere in Russian Federation and kidnapped by Russian army personnel or Russian proxies. Yesterday, uh, we presented our uh, findings at Ukrainian Crisis Media Center, open space for uh, journalists, and we uh, created and presented for a public an interactive map that includes concrete uh, cases with the information about each of uh, civil uh, hostages, with information what happened, when happened, and what we know at this moment. We try to collect as much information as possible in order to con uh, conduct concrete advocacy actions aimed at release of civilian hostages. So we do our research work not only to present information about concrete cases, but in order to conduct concrete planned advocacy actions. We also made an official request more than one time. We made such request to Russian Federation state bodies, penitentiary system, and Russian Federation government representatives about the fact of Ukrainian civilian non-combatants being kidnapped by Russian army or Russian proxies. And we ask Russian side what is such people legal status under Russian law in Russian Federation, how Russian Federation treats them, how their personal data being proceed, and what status Ukrainian civilian hostages receive in Russian Federation while being held in a Russian penitentiary system or prisoner camps. This August, uh, the relatives of kidnapped people and we receive information from Russian authorities, but it was information not from the penitentiary system. It was information from military police, Defense Ministry of Russian Federation, and military police informed us that these Ukrainian civilian hostages, civilian prisoners, were taken into custody because they were acting against special military operation. But we can reassure you that such people, such civilian hostages are not POWs, not prisoners of war, and they can't be treated as prisoners of war. So Russian Federation authorities and uh, government officials see Ukrainian civilians as a POWs, and this is not legal, this is against the international humanitarian law, because uh, uh, such people, they did not participate in conduct, conduct of hostilities, they didn't, didn't participate in the battles, and they can't be treated as a combatants. They are non-combatants, so they are protected as a civilians under IHL. And for example, I can tell you a story of my neighbor, my neighbor Yevgen Goryanov. He worked as a car repairman guy, and uh, he always have like dirty hands and Russian army uh, kidnapped him because they believe that he was handling weapons. So currently he is held in uh, Russian Federation in Bryansk Penitentiary det Detention Center on the grounds of suspicions of carrying weapons, which is uh, it's just fake allegations. Another case study is, uh, for example, when civilians being kidnapped only because they try to help other civilians in dire situation. For example, uh, Mr. Sergei Lubich, he helped uh, people by delivering drinking waters to the city of Hostomel. And Hostomel was destroyed during the first day of Russian invasion because Hostomel have a big military aeroplane place. So uh, he received a phone call from his neighbor asking, can you bring some water for us? There is no infrastructure here. And he was stopped at uh, Russian uh, checkpoints by Russians, blindfolded, and uh, currently he is also held in a uh, penitentiary detention center in uh, Bryansk uh, city, Russian Federation. Ukrainian civilians are treated as uh, POWs, prisoners of war. Their movement is restricted. They are keep in uh, custody. According uh, to the international humanitarian law, occupier state should, should release any sort of civilians in their custody if there is no military necessity. If there was a military necessity during first day of invasion to res restrict such civilians, for sure, five months after uh, Russians were driven from north of Ukraine, there is no legal justification as well as no military necessity to hold back Ukrainian civilians in Russian custody. 
we have information from uh, prisoners that were released that they were being tortured during interrogation. They were forced to sing Russian anathem. They were first forced to do uh, like hundreds of push-ups. So Russian Federation uh, conduct degrading and inhumane treatment of Ukrainian civilians. They are also being brainwashed. They are forced to uh, participate in so-called referendums in uh, south of Ukraine. So Russian Federation conducting degrading and inhumane treatment of Ukrainian civilians in their custody. They are confined not in the prisoners of war camps, but they are confined in prisons. They have no right to walk, to sports. They have no ability to communicate with relatives. So they are treated not, not as a prisoners of war. They don't have uh, privileges that uh, prisoners of war have, have. So sometimes they have completely incommunicado without ability to reach for an advocate or to inform a family member about where a person is located. Sometimes they allow to have one hour walk, but it's not regularly. So they are in the gray zone, but they are also treated worse than people sitting in Russian prisons. And I can assure you that Russian prison is nothing good and there is no uh, standards or due diligence about condition in Russian prison. I myself, Mikhail Sava, was in uh, custody for eight months as um, a political uh, prisoner in Russian Federation. And when you have only one hour walk a day, it's negatively influenced not only your uh, physical health, but also your mental health, mental ability to cope with the stress. And from 2015, I am a refugee in Ukraine. I have a refugee status in Ukraine. In Ukraine, I learned Ukrainian language, for example. Currently, we know about 24 places of detention at the territory of Russian Federation or at the territory of temporarily occupied Crimean Peninsula. So we specialized on these 24 detention places. Other Ukrainian NGO work with prisons in south of Ukraine or in eastern Ukraine, territories that are currently occupied by Russia or uh, Russian proxies. And in Russian Federation, there is various places of detention, a prison, a, a before trial detention center. But in every case, Ukrainian inmates are held separately from uh, uh, Russian inmates, and they are held in the condition where they can't get access to media, to radio, to television, to internet, to connect with their family members. I have three sort of big questions. One is, what are the challenges that you're finding in your work to do this? Secondly, what comes next for you? You've gathered all this information, you're making your cases. What are the next legal steps um, in, in your work? And finally, you've described so much suffering so much pain. What, what do you think is the strategy behind it for, for Russia? If, if there is one, I'm curious to know what you think about why, why they're doing this. The first challenge is uh, official position of Russian Federation, their practice and policies regarding Ukrainian civilians. So not only Russian Federation violates international humanitarian law and international human rights law, it's also act not like a state entity, it's, it's acting more like a terrorist entity because they're committing uh, war crimes and they uh, held these people on the fake grounds. And this is also a web of lies and official policy of Russian Federation to say that they don't held any prisoners. So I work with Russian advocates that are currently in Russian Federation, and they risking to lose their freedom or to lose their name by going to certain prison. And, uh, and we give a tip to Russian advocate. In this certain place, there is Ukrainian there. And our Russian advocate go to a prison, have a meeting with head of the uh, detention center, a Russian Federation uh, official, deny the fact holding any sort of Ukrainian citizen or Ukrainian civilians at the territory of a prison. So they just lying us.
Another part of our work is our advocacy efforts with the International Committee of Red Cross, with human rights defenders and public intellectuals, and also with people in Russia that called human rights observers. They allowed to visit detention center and to check the condition of everyday prisoners' life. So our aim is also to uh, use and activate uh, Russian human rights defenders in the activity of finding and protecting our civilians in Russian custody. Uh, regarding, regarding the second question, first of all, we ask international community and our international partners to put pressure on Russian Federation officials. Secondly, we as an organization try to reach out with concrete personnel of prisons. So we try to connect to head of the prisons, to prisoners guard, and to force them to respect even Russian Federation law on uh, treatment of pris prisoners. Our next step, and we already conducting this step, is to force Russian officials to respect the law of Russian Federation regarding treatment of prisoners including Ukrainian prisoners, and we are trying to, uh, we are working for the release of all Ukrainian civilian hostages, and it is several hundreds of people, but they are not prisoners of war, they are not combatants, they didn't participate in the conduct of hostilities, the Russian Federation qualification of them is wrong, in order to free uh, all Ukrainian civilian hostages, we also conduct an open advocacy calls because we want all civilized world to understand this, that this problem is exist, that these people are in dire situation and these people need help immediately. Third question, what Russian strategy behind taking civilian hostages? And from my experience of work in this domain, when I myself was interrogated by FSB several years ago, I asked them, do you think that every human rights NGO, every civil activist is your enemy? And uh, the person that was interrogated me confirmed that any person that can uh, show opposition to either government of or Russian Federation government and can bring and unite people is indeed our enemy of state. And uh, as we can see from concrete cases of Ukrainian civilians who were captured, they are, for example, uh, civil representatives of, or volunteers or they are prominent uh, cultural figures and they are held because they either speak Ukrainian or show pro-Ukrainian sentiments. I believe that Russian Federation tried to intimidate Ukrainian population to blackmail Ukrainian uh, nation for pro-democratic choice and pro-European choice. So uh, Russia Federation is trying to uh, change Ukrainian nation to intimidate and blackmail us. I was wondering which stories sort of stand out to you that you would want our listeners to know about. I have dozens of stories that I can share with your listeners. And sometimes they have a bad ending, sometimes they have a fortunately happy ending. For example, yesterday, a Ukrainian woman that was held for half a year in Russia Victoria Andrusha, she is 25 year old uh, teacher of mathematics and uh, successfully and fortunately she wa was released yesterday. But I will uh, speak up now about my neighbor and friend Yevgen Guriano. Uh, for example, when I visit his wife and son, I see that the fence around house was destroyed. And I ask uh, his wife, what uh, happened here? And she says that uh, when Russians arrive, he tried to stop them. He says that I can open the fence, but they just destroy the fence around the house just because they can destroy it senselessly without uh, any legitimate military objective, without any legitimate uh, idea behind. They just uh, bring destruction because they can do it, because they, they believe that they will be not whole held accountable, maybe by international institution or maybe even by their own uh, army commanders. They bring destruction only because they think that they can do it 
without any sort of accountability. It is senseless, illogical, and it, it is just evil. And uh, I can assure you that communication is extremely important for prisoners, for their mental and spiritual health. And uh, communication with relatives is reminiscence of normal normal life, is reminiscence of safe uh, uh, haven. And Russian Federation prisoners officials take this freedom away from our civilian hostages. Uh, communication with advocates, with family members, it is the right that prisoners have, and it is the right that uh, POWs have. And Russian Federation uh, take away this freedom, violating both IHL and uh, local uh, penitentiary legislation. Sometimes we know about the fact of kidnapping, about the fact of Russian army taking civilian hostage, but then person and people just disappear. We don't know where they are being held, or even they are alive or dead. Our aim is to make and to force Russian Federation to make open such information, to open the list of Ukrainian civilian hostages under a Russian Federation control. Thank you very much for your time, Mikhail. Is there anything we haven't spoken about that you would want our listeners to, to think about or to know? Mikhail, thank you for your time. Uh, my uh, fi final remark is that I'm very happy that we were able to establish fruitful communication with Russian activists, Russian advocate, and Russian public intellectuals that are also risking their freedoms in trying to locate and rescue Ukrainian civilian hostages. And uh, I can reassure you that not all Russians are pro-Putin. There is some uh, active pro-democratic uh, Russian Federation citizens that would like to make pro-democratic uh, and right choices in this war with Ukraine. These advocates and activists are of great help for us because we as Ukrainian citizens cannot enter uh, Russian prisons, but they as a uh, Russian Federation legal specialists and advocates can do this work for us, also uh, endangering themselves and endangering their freedoms but uh, fighting for our common cause. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast by The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. You can also listen to this conversation live at 1pm each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, do leave a review as it helps others find the show. To our listeners on YouTube, for reasons beyond our control, there's sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you do want to hear an episode as soon as possible, it's available on your podcast apps. Please search for Ukraine The Latest on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or your preferred app. Check out the Ukraine page on the Telegraph website. As ever, you can get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. We are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was today produced by Madeline Drury and on Twitter, Claire Hubble. <laughs>